What's going on YouTube? My name is Mark Dubs and welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to outline my process for making a Boba Fett helmet when using a 3D printer. This video's topics cover not only the initial printing of the helmet and its accessories, but also covering layer lines, priming, and visor installation as well. I'll also do my best to be as informative as I possibly can for anyone that is possibly utilizing this video as a tutorial. That being said, I'll start by specifying the materials used, software, and printer make and model. So for this project, the type of filament that I used was a 1.75mm PLA from Anycubic. This can be found on Amazon, but I still provided a link in the description below for anybody wanting to purchase that exact filament that I bought. This is available in several colors, but the aspect of the material selection was irrelevant since it was inevitably getting covered with a combination of Bondo, Glaze Putty, and Gray Sandable Primer. So for simplicity's sake, I chose white. In the description below, I've also included the Amazon link for where I purchased my helmet visor as this is another material that will be needed later on in the process. Other materials and tools such as sandpaper, a soldering iron, sandable primer spray paint, super glue, 5 minute epoxy, hot glue, painter's tape, bondo body filler, and spot putty were used for various purposes. This included gap filling, covering layer lines, adhesion of the tinted helmet visor, priming, and melting plastic. All of these products were at one point in time purchased at my local Walmart, so it should be pretty easy to find. Regarding the sandpaper, 80 grit, 120 grit, 180 grit, and 320 grit were all that were necessary for this level of work. The software that I used for this project was Ultimaker Cura 4.11, which can be downloaded at the link in the description below. The software is absolutely free and was pretty widely used, and for the most part, user friendly. Also, if you get hung up on something, there's plenty of online support that you can use, such as YouTube videos, that can assist with whatever technological issue that you're facing. That doesn't mean that you have to use Ultimaker Cura. That's just simply what I chose to use. Finally, the make and model of the printer that I'm using is an Anycubic Mega X. From what I understand, this model is somewhat mid-range in size and pretty cost-effective for someone like myself that's wanting to get into 3D printing. And if you haven't already guessed it, you can rest assured knowing that, yes, I have in fact provided an Amazon link where this printer can be purchased. Now that I've covered what I consider to be preliminary details, I'd like to talk about printing. To start, I would like to take a moment to talk about scaling your helmet to your head. Allow me to lead by example. So at 100%, I was still unable to get my head, with my glasses included, past the interior cheek sections of this helmet. And this is because I have a fat noggin, what can I say? So to correct this issue, I increased the overall size of the helmet by changing the scaling percentages of the X, Y, and Z axis of my STL file. So, at 105%, this helmet fits over my head and my glasses, but is still small enough to fit on my printer's build plate and print as one solid piece. Minus what I suspect was a slight print fail near the end of the print job, but I'll go into further detail about that later on in the video. Nevertheless, my initial attempt to print this helmet did not complete due to a few factors. One, my print was sent to my printer via USB. Two, my computer restarted on its own. And three, this is still a new hobby for me and I simply didn't know enough about 3D printing to recoup from a lost print job, which would essentially be resending the print job at the exact point in time of its initial fail. And as bad as this may seem, however, I actually benefited from this seemingly unfortunate situation. Allow me to elaborate. So the section of the helmet that did print allowed me to test fit the dimensions of the helmet on my head, which at this point was about one third of the way complete so slightly above the cheeks from the bottom up. And to my surprise, this did not fit well. I could only get it on with my glasses off. So as mentioned earlier, I increased the overall size of this helmet on three axes and then printed roughly 5% of the helmet, just enough to be able to do another test fit. From personal experience, I can say it's better to waste an insignificant amount of filament and a short amount of time rather than to waste an entire spool of filament in approximately two days of your time. 
After the second test fitting, I was satisfied with the results and then initiated another print job. But this time, I loaded the G-code file onto an SD card and started the print manually from the printer's interface. So for smaller print jobs, USB is fine. But for a two-day job, I wouldn't take the risk of your computer restarting on its own. Also, I would like to note that while the helmet was printing via SD card, I did experience a brownout and my desktop machines all restarted, clocks reset, etc. And the one thing that wasn't affected was the printer. As stated earlier, there was a section of the helmet at the top of the dome that seemed to not print properly in comparison to the G-code that I sent to my printer. Whether this was a print fail is something that's beyond me. If anyone knows what may have happened, please utilize the comment section below and tell me what you think. I only want to get better at this over time. Anyway, to correct this, I first adhered the top of the dome to the helmet with super glue and then followed up with some leftover PLA from an old spool and melted it to the helmet. I figured that the helmet's structural integrity would only be improved in that area if the plastic that it was made out of was melted together, rather than simply relying on an adhesive. Now this was performed with a soldering iron, so cue the proverbial air quotes when I describe this as plastic welding. This method was also utilized in attaching other parts of this model that were printed separately from the helmet that you saw in an earlier clip. Once the helmet was assembled for the most part, the next part of the process involved covering layer lines and filling in large gaps that were caused by what I, again, suspect was a print fail near the end of my print job. But don't quote me on that. To get started with filling large gaps and covering layer lines, this is something that is actually quite simple. Large gaps, like the one at the very top of the dome, on this print would need to be filled in with a body filler. Body filler is a more robust material that is quite frankly able to take more abuse as opposed to spot or glaze putty. Whereas spot putty is a material that is much softer and easier to sand away. And it also sets much more quickly and doesn't have to be mixed with a catalyst in order to start setting. Therefore, it's better suited for more shallow grooves and dents. Once these areas have been filled and sanded, the residual from the sanding should be either blown off or thoroughly dusted off, followed by a couple of coats of sandable primer. Essentially, that's all there really is to it. Fly filler, sand, prime, rinse and repeat until you're satisfied with the end result. I will say, it is okay to overspray the model slightly for the first time around because this will also act as a filler and ultimately help with covering layer lines. However, too much primer can be a bad thing because it can detract from the overall sharpness of the model, making edges look less sharp and slightly more rounded. Also, as a side note, if anyone is wondering why I didn't sand the helmet itself, PLA filament does not sand very well. If I had printed this model with a PETG filament, my approach would have been slightly different as I understand that PETG is much more easily sandable than PLA. The next topic of interest is going to be about making a visor template. Now this is something that in my experience is not terribly difficult. All I did was tape a sheet of heavyweight cardstock inside of the helmet and trace the contour of the visor cut out from the helmet onto the paper. Then I simply drew a wider shape around the initial tracing that was also relative to the inside surface area of the helmet, as the purpose of the original tracing is only to provide a point of reference. This may take some trial and error to get it exactly perfect, but it is better to waste a few sheets of paper than to waste a $15 visor in two days for shipping. After that, I traced the template onto the visor with a visible marker and cut out the desired shape. I used an old pair of culinary scissors to cut this out because, quite frankly, that was the most readily available tool that I had. But they seemed to be pretty robust, so ultimately, cutting this visor out was not difficult. Visor installs, however, can give you a hard time when trying to adhere them to the inside surface area of the helmet. My quick and dirty method in accomplishing this is to first, quote, tack the visor in place with a gel-style super glue in combination with a super glue accelerator. Both of these items can be found at most local craft stores. 
This is then followed by filling in any gaps between the outer edges of the tinted visor and the interior surface area of the helmet with hot glue. And the reason for this lies within the final adhesive that I use in this process, which is JB Weld's Clear 5-Minute Epoxy, which in this case, I chose to start on a flat side of an old silicone mold that's no longer in use. Based on the footage that I do have, you may notice that there are distinguished lines where the visor was masked off prior to the application of the 5 minute epoxy. Any surface area on the visor that is not taped up needs to be scuffed with 120 grit sandpaper or less. And this will create grooves for the epoxy to grip onto, as opposed to it adhering to a perfectly flat surface. My final recommendation for visor installation is simply this. The outside of the visor will most likely not match up perfectly with the cutout on the helmet, and some gap filling may be required. So to correct this issue, mask off the visor on the outside of the helmet and apply Bondo as needed. Sand, and finally prime. Pull your tape and you're good to go. In closing, for someone like myself that's already worked with other materials and utilized different methods, I would have to say that this method is by far far the easiest when it came to making cosplay armor. Now I've already explored the world of Pepecura, or in other words, papercraft, and yes, I have made a Boba Fett helmet using this method, but not only was my production time of creating this base model cut into just a third, but the quality is much better in comparison. Now, 3D printing cosplay weapons and armor will be the primary focus of this channel, but will not be limited to only that. There are other topics that I want to cover. For example, my next video will actually cover creating a silicone mold off of this helmet and casting a resin copy of that helmet. Once I have both a resin casted copy and a 3D printed copy, the third and final video will feature both of these helmets being painted with the Return of the Jedi paint job and the updated paint job from the Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian. Now as it stands now, I will do my best to get content out as frequently as possible. I want to try and shoot for about every two weeks or so, and I will provide updates as frequently as I am able to. Seriously guys, I do have some pretty cool stuff planned out for this channel, and I'm certain that you guys won't want to miss it. So until then, thank you for watching my first video, and may the force be with you.